good afternoon, and it is absolutely fantastic to see that it is, um, the room is packed. And it's packed, um, I think, because we are launching, and we are indeed launching, the future uh, of digital twins uh, via the Turing Research and Innovation Cluster, specifically in digital twins. So let me just try and canter through the next 15 minutes. Um, the, the team pr provided me with 13 slides, and given my uh, ability to fill time quite quickly um, with, uh, with, with various words and so on, I'm going to have to really move very fast here. But let me just um, set the scene. Digital twins. So digital twins are not computational models or simulation models. Digital twins are not sensor networks monitoring of systems on their own. Digital twins are not CAD systems or building information management systems uh, on their own or computational systems. Digital twins are a synthesis of these cyber-based uh, digital representations of the actual physical or socioeconomic uh, reality that we wish to study or that we wish to control. And it is that synthesis that uh, we at Turing uh, mean when we talk about digital twins. So there is a lot of hype, a lot of excitement uh, about AI and GPT-4 now. Uh, there is also a lot of hype and a lot of excitement about digital twins. And so what I want to do um, is really just set the context for whether we should be really excited um, with a hint of skepticism uh, or what. So, um, what have we got here? This is the launch program. Um, I'm going to present the strategic vision um, in the next 13 minutes or so. Uh, there will be some uh, discussion about the actual themes uh, of the, the, the research and innovation cluster. We'll hear from our partners in the National Air Traffic Service uh, about Project Bluebird, building a digital twin of UK airspace. Um, and then there will be uh, a panel discussion. So just in case anyone was wondering who this chap was, um, I'm Mark Girolami, I'm the chief scientist at the Alan Turing Institute. And if you want to just take a photograph of the, the code there, uh, it'll lead you into some of the details uh, that uh, I'm going to be skirting over very quickly. So since the inception of the Alan Turing Institute in 2015, Turing has invested strategically around about 26 million, and that's now exceeded uh, 30 million, in establishing digital twin research and innovation capability. So we have been very focused on not only investing in building capacity and capability in research, but also in innovation. And our portfolio uh, includes activities across a broad range uh, of domains uh, with various applications in just about every sector of engineering, the environment, health, and the social sciences. And we undertake digital twin research from the very basic fundamentals, so theorem proofs, all the way through to deploying applications in the real world in collaboration with our business, commercial, and government partners. And to build on our success, we are now looking to the next five years and what we can do to force multiply the impact of Turing's research and innovation and that of others in the UK in digital twins. But first of all, let's just look back at some of the key themes uh, in our digital twin work uh, to date. 
ecosystems of digital twins. You'll hear an awful lot uh, about that. And Turing and Turing research teams have played a key role in advancing the foundational theory of digital twin research. We have published in some of the prime international scientific journals, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Nature, uh, and, and so on, on some of that basic theoretical work which lays the foundations for the innovation and the exploitation of the technologies uh, that emerge uh, from this, this research. In terms of ecosystems, um, well, digital twin technologies in certain areas are pretty well established, certainly in a number of domains. And they're increasingly being used to link into ecosystems uh, of digital twins. But there are serious foundational issues and challenges that still remain. There are some theoretical, methodological, algorithmic and software-based challenges to realize this whole notion of the development uh, of ecosystems uh, of digital twins. And what Turing has been doing is we've been bringing together multidisciplinary expertise in urban analytics, in complex systems engineering, in econometrics. Turing researchers have developed foundational methodologies to construct ecosystems of digital twins. And just recently, um, we've been working with Scania, uh, the truck uh, uh, manufacturers, in developing an ecosystem of truck fleets uh, for Scania. And likewise, some of our, uh, the team that you'll hear from today uh, have been developing ecosystems uh, of digital twins that represent uh, whole wind farms. And these ecosystems of digital twins will support, for example, policymakers in developing more effective and well thought through interventions in complex multidisciplinary areas such as, for example, climate change mitigation or disease transmission. The 3D bridge, um, which I seem to have lived and breathed for the, the last five years, um, really started off with some fundamental research questions, um, but uh, forms the end-to-end -end research and innovation system. Um, so we really focus uh, on delivering impact in the real world and deploying uh, real-world applications of digital twins. And one of the programs at the Turing uh, worked with a diverse range of partners um, from the pioneering company MX3D, who developed the WireArc uh, additive manufacturing technology to 3D print steel structures at massive scales. We worked with Arup, uh, we worked with Autodesk uh, and Force Technology. And what did we do? Turing built a digital twin of the world's very first 3D printed stainless steel bridge. This was a cutting edge architectural design and engineering experiment. We equipped the, the bridge with a sensor network that enables it to monitor and allows us to analyze its performance uh, in, in actual operation. The work regarding this bridge, which now spans one of the canals in the city of Amsterdam, was highlighted by Forbes magazine as being one of the best examples of digital twins that everyone should know about. Something else that we're very proud of at Turing is effective quadratures and the way it has had a huge impact on one of the UK's most important engineering companies, Rolls-Royce. So our team at Turing developed this open source software framework called Effective uh, 
quadratures, which enabled the teams to analyse, test and audit complex interconnected systems of black box models. Now the software is being used to analyse models and data in a wide range of application domains. And it includes Rolls-Royce who have been using it in blade design uh, and building streamlined uh, jet engines, making them more fuel efficient and resulting in lower carbon footprints. We move away from the world's first 3D printed bridge. We move away from helping Rolls-Royce explore the hugely high dimensional design spaces um, of the, uh, their blades to something a bit softer, which is growing underground. This is a company that Turing uh, has been working with for quite some time um, on the, the whole area of environment and sustainability. With Growing Underground, we developed a digital twin of another world's first, the world's first urban underground farm, which sits under, actually, where does it sit under? Can anyone remind me? Clapham Junction, right? So a disused tube line under Clapham Junction, there is this uh, underground farm. And if you visit the Turing's uh, digital twin, Turing and Research Innovation Cluster uh, um, demos uh, downstairs, you'll actually see uh, growing underground uh, with, 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 uh, with, with some of the things that they've been doing. The work that we did with, with that company uh, basically enabled the time to grow their crops to be reduced by as much as 50% and improving yields by up to 25%. And that is um, something, again, that we are incredibly proud of. So the world's first, another world's first from the Turing uh, in digital twinning, uh, the, the world's first uh, urban underground farm. If we think of the maritime sector, We've worked very closely uh, with the, the marine and maritime industry to build trust and verification resources for digital twin technologies to enable their use or their deployment and their use in safety critical systems. And by developing a semi-automated test framework, we're now able to validate a maritime digital twin for uh, remit uh, monitoring. This work has led to Lloyd's Register awarding a digital twin approved certification. And again, this is the first independent verification of digital twin technology in the maritime industry. So this is very much focusing at the innovation end of things, making sure that we can pull through the great research into great technologies that will actually be adopted uh, and used to great effect. And one last thing, IceNet and working with um, our, our partners at the British Antarctic Survey, um, the Turing teams have developed this, uh, this machine learning uh, model for Arctic sea ice forecasting and it can help improve regional and global climate model predictions. IceNet enables and improves our understanding of the complex interconnections of large scale climate phenomena and sea ice variability. And the reason for that is to reduce the uncertainties in future climate predictions. We are now working in partnership with the British Antarctic Survey and embedding IceNet in a digital twin of the RSS Sir David Attenborough, the flagship UKRI and NERC polar research vessel, leading to safer, more efficient Antarctic routing. These examples provide a small snapshot of some of the amazing work that's happened 
with Turing and with our partners. And throughout the past seven years, the Alan Turing Institute has built a presence in the digital twin space and provides both national and international leadership in digital twin science, technology, and deployment. And many members of the Turing community are very heavily involved in the national digital twin leadership. Our director of innovation, Simon Reeve, and Turing fellow, uh, Gavin Shaddock, are heavily involved in Credo. We have close links to the Connected Places uh, digital uh, catapult, uh, digital twin hub, for which I sit on the strategic board. The Turing Research and Innovation Cluster in Digital Twins forms an important part of the UK's landscape that will help accelerate the UK to the forefront of digital twin research and maximise the impacts of this for societal good. So what is this digital twin research and innovation uh, cluster? Well, it's certainly befitting that the National Centre, the UK's National Centre for Data Science and AI, that it accepts the challenge of developing digital twin capability as a national resource and as a national service. And by doing so, we will empower the widespread adoption and safe use of digital twins to deliver national societal and economic benefit, and in the process, consolidate the UK's leadership as the world leaders in digital twin research and innovation. And so today, it's hugely exciting that this new initiative, this national initiative, the Turing Research and Innovation Cluster in Digital Twins is being announced. Now, what is a Turing Research and Innovation Cluster? Well, it's a mechanism by which the UK will be able to cluster expertise, capability, capacity from wherever it is in the UK or indeed internationally and bring it together to achieve more than the sum of their individual parts. So those centres of excellence, those hubs, those strategic capabilities will be clustered together in a synergistic way to deliver that force multiplier for the UK. And the, excuse me, the, the Turing Research and Innovation Cluster in Digital Twins is going to pull together across a range of diverse do domains, diverse disciplines, and geographies to make the UK the place for digital twins. One example, this summer we will have the director for the national, for the NSF, the, the United States, NSF AI Centre for Dynamical Systems. And he's coming here to the UK and spending the year with us at the Turing to develop the underlying digital twin theory and methodology for, 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 for dynamical systems. The key words in research and innovation cluster are research, innovation, and clustering. And so there are three primary aims of the trick. The first is to advance the science and innovation of digital twinning and use these advances to address important societal challenges. And tomorrow, our chief executive and chair of the board will be uh, announcing the Turing's strategy. And one of the components of that strategy will be focusing on the development and the organization around a number a small number of societally important 
grand challenges. And the Turing Research and Innovation uh, Cluster in Digital Twins uh, will be doing exactly the same thing. We will also produce open and reproducible computational tools for digital twin development and deployment as a national resource. And the third aim is to ensure that we democratise the access to digital twin technology for all. And how will we do this? We'll do it by tackling significant, grand challenges in three themes. And we'll use these as anchors around which uh, we'll develop and establish interoperable processes to deploy digital twins into the industry, policy making, and healthcare systems of the future. We will be looking at managing diverse, biodiversity. You'll hear more from the, the, uh, the, the directors of the trick just shortly. We'll be modeling, for example, the short streets um, following on from our partnership with the Department for Transport. We're also working uh, with clinicians at Guy's and St. Thomas's on digital twins of the heart. And again, you'll hear more uh, from, from the, one of the directors uh, of the trick on that. Uh, likewise, uh, with infrastructure, um, you'll hear more from the, the team uh, that are working uh, on digital twinning uh, of, of uh, um, infrastructure. So let me just conclude by saying that We've got here, not just by painless um, investment and a, a, an easy glide to where we are today. It's been very, very challenging. It's been very, very hard work. And I'd like to thank uh, the team that are here in front of me, who you're now going to meet. And I'd like to especially uh, just thank uh, uh, Ben MacArthur, uh, who has pulled this together, has tires, tirelessly uh, and remorselessly um, worked uh, to, to develop this uh, and to deliver this for the UK. So I'm going to step down and um, I think there's going to be a video uh, of the Digital Twin uh, Turing Research and Innovation Cluster and then I'll hand over to those that are far better to, uh, to talk about it than I am. The Alan Turing Institute has established the largest concentration of digital twins research in the UK in areas from aerospace and civil engineering to urban modelling and towards ecosystems of digital twins. The Turing Research and Innovation Cluster in Digital Twins is a new research and innovation mechanism that will tackle significant challenges in the areas of environment, infrastructure and health focusing on digital twin technologies. So what is a digital twin? Put simply, a digital twin is a virtual model of an object or process in the physical world. The digital twin is updated with sensor data from its physical counterpart, and by analyzing the twin, decision makers can gain insights into the behavior of the physical system. For example, Turing's digital twin research includes a digital twin of an underground farm used to simulate potential operational changes and the impacts on growing conditions. The primary objective of the TRIC Digital Twins is to democratise digital twin technology by providing open access tools, techniques and understanding to research and innovation communities in the UK and beyond. It has been delivered in partnership with a small number of key research and industrial development partners. Digital twins in environment and sustainability provide a shift in our understanding of environmental change and prediction abilities and provide the insights that are crucial for climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Work includes development of a digital twin of the seabed for use in monitoring and predicting change in marine protected areas. When working within infrastructure, digital twins can be used to monitor and control processes in real time. Ambitions include accelerating the decarbonization process of infrastructure and enhancing the resilience of critical aging infrastructure. Digital twins will also look to improve operational efficiency of aircraft by providing information on the operational conditions of flight. Digital twins also help 
with the drive towards net zero, for example by providing information on the optimal operation of offshore wind farms. In health, the ambition is to conduct far-reaching developments in digital twinning and cardiology, developing novel personalised heart digital twins which will continuously update from their physical counterparts. Work will address the big implementation questions that are needed to bring digital twin technology into the clinic, starting and finishing with the patient need. These challenges require the bringing together of expertise from across sectors to work jointly on a solution that will benefit people and societies across the world. It is together that Trick Digital Twins will succeed. We're going to have a bit of like a quick round where the co-directors of the teams are going to come and tell us a little bit about all of them. Uh, they have just a few minutes, so uh, if you have any questions for them, as I said, don't forget you have the Slido at the end, um, and all there's going to be a panel, and they can answer your questions. So, um, shall we? Shall we start? I don't think I'm forgetting anything. <laughs> and um, the first one, I want to invite the environment um, co-director, Kirstine um, Dale. Yes. Please clap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kirsten Dell, and with my colleague John Sidorn, I am the, we are the co-directors for the environment and sustainability theme of the trick. <coughs> and we're both thrilled to be part of this exciting initiative and that excitement is shared by our host organisations of the National Oceanography Centre and the Joint Centre for Excellence in Environmental Intelligence and the Met Office where I work. So I'm going to say a little bit about John to begin with. So John, this is going to feel a little bit like this is your life. <laughs> so John, when you were a child, no, I'm not going to start that far back. Um, so John is the uh, Interim Director of Data Science and Technology at the National Oceanography Centre. He's also the Associate Director for Digital and the Ocean. Prior to that, um, John worked um, with me at the Met Office where he was the head of ocean forecasting research and development and John has a very firm and full background in sea shelf modelling. Before, see, see I told you it was going to be like, this is your life. Um, before joining the Met Office, <laughs> um, John worked for, uh, for NERC's Plymouth Marine, uh, Marine Lab. And like me, and this is the really important bit, both John and I are passionate about applying data science to advance and accelerate environmental science and services. And John's experience complements my own. So I'm not going to talk about me. Um, so I am the Met Office's Principal Fellow for Data Science and I work with the Informatics Lab, some of whom are here today. Welcome Informatics Lab. And we are charged with leading the goal to harness the power of data science to push the frontiers of weather and climate science and services. As part of my role leading data science at the Met Office, I am also the co-director for the Joint Centre for Excellence in Environmental Intelligence. And this is a partnership that brings together the University of Exeter and the Met Office to pioneer development of environmental information research, sorry, intelligence research solutions and education. So I've been at the Met Office a while in a range of scientific roles, but all of them have the theme of leadership and delivering high value um, interdisciplinary research partnerships. So together, John and I have the vision uh, for the uh, environment and sustainability arm of the trick to fully realise, oops, down there, fully realise the potential for digital twin technologies to play a central role in addressing the challenges associated with environmental and climatic change. There we go. So to do this, we are going to be drawing on our combined um, infrastructure and relationships, and this crosses the National Oceanog Oceanography Centre, the Joint Centre for Excellence in Environmental Intelligence, which, as I said, is this partnership between the University of Exeter and the Met Office. And I've put some of the images up here of some of the assets and infrastructure that we hope to be able to draw on 
So many of you will recognise Bertie McBankfest. There is a small version down on the third floor, should you wish to go and have a look. Um, we will also be drawing on high-performance compu computing then at the university, the vibrant university campus, the networks and the learning environment that that pr presents. And then on the Met Office side of things, we're looking at operational delivery, which, which is very good for demonstrating impact, observations and monitoring networks, predictions, projections and impacts, and as I said, the team that I'm working with at the moment, the informatics lab. So looking at what we're doing to begin with, um, first of all, we are growing our team. So if you're interested, keep your eye out. There will be adverts soon. Uh, we are also mapping the environment and sustainability digital twin landscape. So it's important to see there's quite a lot of activities already operating in this space. And we need to pull together similar themes and identify what the overlaps are, where the synergies are, where's there an opportunity to work together and what some of the gaps might be. So I say, who's doing what? How do we make the most of our collective efforts to accelerate digital twins in the sector? We are also working on some demonstrators. For example, the uh, NOC and the team that John oversees are working on a marine protected areas digital twin, which, again, you can find out more about down on the third floor. And we are drawing together related activities. For example, uh, piloting an information management framework for environmental digital twins. That includes the uh, marine protected areas digital twin that uh, Mark and um, I've mentioned now. Um, pulling together some of the work that we're doing on Twine. So Twine is twinning capability for the natural environment, which is another digital twin program running in the environment um, sector. And we are aligning our activities with the other two themes within the TREC. And this is a good point for me to hand over to Steve to talk about his thing. So I'm Steve Niederer. I'm a professor uh, at King College, King's College London uh, for the moment, Imperial College from the 1st of May. Uh, and I will be leading on the uh, health theme as part of the trick. And so the goal for me is really to think about how we can start to use digital twins, which might have been often applied in conventional industrial settings, and moving those into healthcare applications where I think there is huge benefit and huge opportunity for using twins to both better monitor patients, but also to better anticipate their needs. So we look at treating patients on an individual level, but also treating them, treating them on their anticipated or expected outcomes, not on how they are today. So the goal for the trick is going to be looking at how we can reduce the barriers for people to make use of digital twin technology. When we think of many people working in the healthcare space, there is a, when I, I think of the clinicians that we work with, uh, there can be a huge technical barrier to saying, how are you going to take data from patients? How are you going to move it into a space where you can make a physics model? How are you going to update that model through time? So there are a large number of components that need to come together, and we like to make tools which might reduce the barriers for researchers to access that space. We like to facilitate, when we think about the trick, where we have these multiple different domains, how we can share best practice across domains. There are many lessons that we can think of learning from infrastructure or in aerospace that might be able to be brought into health and to be able to accelerate and, and increase the adoption of digital twins in that area. And also, and lastly, we'd like to think about how we can move digital twins from being a research application where we're using these in small numbers of case studies to demonstrate ideas, to moving them from that research tool to more into a clinical service. So how do we start to put these technology into the NHS so that it is serving patients and not just being used as a research uh, technology? So this is how we uh, view most of the cardiologists uh, that we look with. And this is really how we think digital twins can come in. So we have our cardiologist here with their picture of a heart. And what we'd like to have is a digital twin of the patients so that we can have a representation of that individual patient. And that representation can combine multiple different data streams about that individual, from genomics, from imaging, and from wearables, and to provide a, a better system for monitoring our patients while they're out in the, in the real world. It also provides a framework for doing what-if testing, so that doctors can speculate or test what were different treatments, how would they deliver a pacemaker, how would they deliver a particular drug, and would that patient be likely to respond? How would they respond, and what would the anticipated risks be? And what is the uncertainty in those predictions? And lastly, we come to thinking about forecasting. So if we have a digital twin of an individual patient, can we anticipate how they're going to respond after the procedure, 
during the procedure, immediately after or six months after? And can we use that to better inform decisions from a clinical side, but importantly, also inform decisions from the patient side and reduce uncertainty for patients and how they're living their lives and how they're making decisions? So the goal that we then have is it would like to take these multiple different data streams, and so those might be information about omics, of which the UK has really been a leader uh, from the molecular scale, information potentially about tissue scales, so we might have imaging information about how much the heart is deforming, how fast is electrical properties moving through the heart, or uh, how stiff the material is. And then we can get a lot of information about the shape of the heart and anatomical information that can be used to describe the, each individual patient's anatomy. What I think is important to realize is that there is a huge variation in these different properties, that these properties vary with diseases, they vary with genders, they vary with ancestry, and they vary with age. And so we really need to be how, looking at how we can capture all of this diversity at all these different scales and in integrating them into representation of the individual heart. And so we have our booth downstairs if people are interested where you can ask to have a representative heart or of your heart printed. So we can look at looking at large databases and saying if you have a particular BMI, a particular age, a particular gender, what is the most representative heart that we have or our best estimate of what your heart is? And so that provides a way of starting this kind of idea of building digital twins for large numbers of people and doing this at scale. And we can integrate all of these, these into a scalable physics and physiology constrained framework. So when we think of sometimes of the classical AI, we will think of neural networks We have a completely unbiased approach, which is fantastic. But there's also a lot that we know from 100 years or 200 years of physiology and laboratory experiments which are captured in that physiology. There's a lot we know about physical constraints that we'd like to encode within our physics-based model. So by combining both the data science approach with what we know about physiology with physics uh, in these models, we can find a scalable and explainable and verifiable framework for interpreting our patients' data. And just to note, this is a, is a movie which I particularly like, which was generated by uh, Rosie Burrows, one of my PhD students, uh, where we're seeing the heart beating, and we're seeing looking at the fiber structure, or the muscle structure, as it deforms during that cardiac cycle. And the end goal here is really thinking about the patients, and I think that that uh, obviously has to be a clear impact and clear driver, and that we think about patients, there are a number of things that patients would like. They would like to know what's wrong with them. They would like to know what their treatment will be. They would like to know what the expectations are that the therapy they're going to get is going to work. There are a number of patients that we have in the UK, I think of the pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, who are there where they have a disease which has a high rate of hospitalizations and they have a lot of uncertainty about, uh, about their disease and about their lifestyle. So that means they can't go on holiday. They can't go on visits. They are uncertain about if they're going to be feeling unwell in one week or a month, so they can't plan. And so I think this ability to provide these forecasts, as I said, importantly both for the patient and for the clinician, is going to be one of the critical parts of delivering our digital twin vision. So when I think about what the immediate aims will be of uh, the, the, the trick in digital twins, I think of the uh, fact that in healthcare we're not making digital twins as we might in some of other domains of a bridge or a building or a car or tens of turbines. We're thinking about how do we make digital twins of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and onto a million uh, different entities or assets. And if we think of UK Biobank, that has 100,000 uh, data sets in it. How do you make digital twins of 100,000 individuals? That is a, a computationally and technically challenging uh, problem, but also a great opportunity, which the UK is really leading on. And also, how do we make that more easy for people to access these type of tools and technologies? And so I think that with the trick, and particularly with the, the research software engineering and support of the Turing, we have the ability to build out these kind of programs so that we can make these tools and resources available to the wider UK research community. And then starting with UK Biobank, that gives you the technology and the confidence to then move on to the large hospital-based repositories of data uh, that we can have access to. We want to look at how we can uh, be better at calibrating these models and how we can accelerate that process and how do we accelerate from calibrate models not only from hospital data, which is very invasive and very specific, but also from wearable data. And we also want to look at how we can make uh, kind of data sets available that provide an on-ramp for people who want to work in this area. So having worked with a number of statisticians and computational scientists who may not have clinical collaborators, healthcare can often be a very exciting area to work in, but an area which has a number of barriers as far as getting the right information. And so by making publicly available data sets, we feel that we'll be able to make tools and resources that will allow researchers from different areas, from visualizations and uh, computational statistics, to move into uh, working in the digital twin space in health. 
And lastly, we want to look at how we can make uh, digital twins as a clinical service. And so we have, looking down the bottom, this is a, a, what we're currently doing is within my group, we run clinical studies, we recruit patients, we make computational models of their hearts, we predict how to deliver therapy, and we look at how we can guide that care. But these are all done in very finite research spaces. And the question is, how do we start to scale from a research project which works in one hospital to a clinical service that might be able to work across multiple hospitals and to service a large number of patients? And so that would really be where we'd like to see this at the end. And so with that, I pass on to Keith uh, from Infrastructure. So, hi. I'm one half of the composite being that is the co-director for infrastructure. The, the other half is, is, is my colleague, David White. Um, we're both from the University of Sheffield, and we're both from a background in structural dynamics. Um, usually working on, on the principle that the best way to understand large-scale structure pieces of infrastructure is in terms of their vibrational or dynamic properties. So David is the professor of nonlinear dynamics at the University of Sheffield. Uh, he's also the PI on a very large program grant, DigiTwin, which I, I believe was one of the first uh, really major grants on digital technology from UKRI. It's just running down at the moment after five five and a half years. I am a professor in mechanical engineering in Sheffield, um, and I'm the PI on a, a program grant called ROSEHIPS, which is about the health monitoring of populations of infrastructure objects. Our vision here that we've provided really echoes marks at the, at the beginning of the um, session. It's quite... Um, high level, and we intend to provide a focal point for academic, industrial, and policy stakeholders in digital twin technology, particularly where it relates to dynamic systems. We want to generate collaboration and smooth the transition of technology in, in, into industry and to coordinate cross-disciplinary studies. And possibly one of the most important things here is we want to democratise digital, digital twin technology, which is to say, make the results of the research available to industry, to the public, um, through open source software tools, open data initiatives. Um, now. So... Infrastructure means quite a lot of things to quite a lot of people. Um, you'll see that what I'm concentrating on here is large discrete elements of uh, infrastructure structures. Now, in, in, in this context, the digital twin is some virtual mirror of the physical object. Um, the physical twin will interact with the digital twin in, um, in two ways. Um, information will flow from the physical twin to the digital twin in terms of data measured across the structure uh, or structures of interest, test validation results and feedback. In return, the digital twin will provide decision support to any operators of the structure. It'll provide predictive um, capability to people who want to <coughs> manage or operate structures. Um, now, <coughs> as a couple of examples, digital twins, I, I, I believe, are, are context-specific. Um, they're designed with a particular objective in mind. Um, now, one of the objectives that we, we, um, we see a lot in structural dynamics is structural health monitoring. Essentially, we might have an object like the bridge there, which I think is somber. Um, and we're measuring data from this on a daily continuous basis from accelerometers, from displacement sensors. And, and the question is, can this data 
tell us something about the health of the structure? Well, actually, it can. It's a complicated problem, but one way to do that is to establish a digital twin <coughs> and then continuously make predictions about the behaviour of the structure. If these predictions start to deviate from the data that we're actually measuring, this gives an, an indication that something's changed about the bridge. Um, we use a lot of machine learning technology, <coughs> excuse me, in the development of structural health monitoring systems. Um, at, um, at a population level, we might have uh, an offshore or an onshore wind farm. And we might be interested in the individual health of the structures, in which case we would want a digital twin in order to do this novelty detection procedure to look at the health. But we might also be interested in the farm at a population level. If the objective is to try and predict at a specific time what the flow of power into the grid will be, then we actually need um, a much more complicated digital twin which will couple the wind field across a farm into the behaviour of individual wind turbines. This is really complicated because if the wind changes direction, the wake fields of individual turbines will move off some turbines and onto others and change their power production capability or behaviour. And so we've got a very complicated interaction there between um, a continuous flow field across an entire farm and the individual structural dynamics of wind turbines. So some quite interesting um, problems that we need digital twins in order to address. Now what I, I haven't put here is I, I haven't shown any um, distributed infrastructure, but this comes under the remit of the theme as well. So road networks, rail networks, the grid. It would be interesting to have a digital twin of these objects so that we can make um, predictions um, across the physical objects. Predictions for a road network will give us ideas about um, whether there's congestion building somewhere and whether or not we can redirect traffic and relieve the congestion. So again, echoing back to Mark's presentation at the beginning. A digital twin is, is not just a model. It's not just a digital support system. It's not just some means of um, setting design rules. It's all of these things in quite a complex in interaction. This is what we've established or um, what David established in, Digi in DigiTwin as the interacting components in a dynamical problem. And these may be different for other contexts. They'll be different in an environmental context and they may be different in a health context. But the main ingredients will still be there. The core ingredient is always some sort of model which has to be validated, some sort of uncertainty management, and ultimately we will want to get decision support. So I haven't we haven't got decision support as an actual box here, but the control box assumes um, decision support before we make an action. Now, the immediate aims of, uh, of the infrastructure component of the trick um, are very um, similar to the other themes in their, in their motivation. Um, in particular, first of all, we need to grow the team. We're at the start of quite a big adventure here, and we need to get people involved in it. Now, the, 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 the two things that David and I have identified um, as important research objectives at first are, are at different scales on the digital twin. So first of all, we want to develop that underpinning mathematical technology to develop a formal theory of digital twins, if you like, but also to develop a framework for embodying digital twins. And this will have to be across scales and environments. And so one of the things that David's team has done is establish a software framework called the Digital Twin Operational Platform, or DTOP, which allows the construction, visualization, validation 
of digital twins. And an initial version of that software has been used on various structures, but possibly the most ambitious one is this um, BAE Hawk aeroplane, which is in our laboratory for verification and validation in Sheffield. Now, if anybody's interested in this structure, we have a stand downstairs with uh, the guys who do the actual testing um, on the stand. And so they'll be able to answer any questions that you might have about that. And I think that's where I stop. Thank you. I just want to welcome uh, Kirsty Whitaker to tell us a little bit about the hub as well. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. And um, so thank you, everyone, for coming along. Thank you to all of the co-directors of the trick and to Mark for giving you all of this um, sort of overview of the ambition. And it turns out that it's uh, partly my responsibility, but heavily shared <laughs> with a new hire who is joining us. He's watching remotely uh, from Bristol, uh, Dr. Chris Burr who's recently joined the Tools, Practices, and Systems program at the Turing Institute, but he has been at the Institute for a long time as an ethics fellow as part of the public policy program. And it's our responsibility to bring all of these different areas of work together, to build something, as Mark said at the beginning, that is greater than the sum of its parts, and that also has a real meaningful impact on the world for a, for a positive societal benefit. So, good luck to us. Um, some of our ideas for how we're going to go about doing that is thinking about communication. Communication, communication, communication. Everything is going to really come down to communication. We're telling you, standing on a stage with a microphone, we're telling you right now what we want to do. But we have to evolve that. We have to both make sure that we're keeping you up to date. We're reaching out to the people who are working in similar areas. We're partnering with um, organizations. And we are we're sort of taking that conversation forward at a national level. One of our other areas of focus for this um, Innovation and Impact Hub is going to be thinking about knowledge commons. So what resources are required for all of the members of the research um, domains, so those include the, the new hires that I think every one of the co-directors has said that we'll be, we'll be advertising for, so keep an eye out, uh, members of their existing teams, members at partner organizations, what, uh, what skills and what trainings and what knowledge do they need to be able to effectively collaborate with each other? And we have two research projects at the Institute that are already uh, available. So we have the Turing Way, which is a project, uh, an open source book that I started back in 2018, but is now co-created with 300 uh, contributors, open source contributors around the world. And that started out as a book that's heavily focused on reproducibility and then expanded into, into other areas of collaboration as well. And uh, Chris, uh, within the public policy program at the Institute, started up a project called the Turing Commons, which looks at responsible research and innovations and how to do ethical and trustworthy research well. So we already have some of those resources. We also have really fantastic resources from the research engineering group at the Institute who have built demonstrators of open source um, code for some of the projects that Mark mentioned in his, uh, in his talk at the beginning of this session. So we can curate and bring together some of those examples, some of the training, some of the skills, and make sure that we are s supporting each other to learn from each other. There are um, strengths and in each of these different domain areas uh, that can be transferred to others that will be really, really strong. We're going to support our network. So the trick sort of sitting on its own is not going to sort of succeed. It has to be embedded within a UK-wide and maybe an international community of people working on digital twins research. And so part of our responsibility in the central hub is to make sure that people have access to um, calls for funding opportunities to uh, jobs, that we're promoting jobs for early career researchers, and that we're finding other ways to, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the word synergize each other's research to deliver on that public good. Unbelievably important to the real world impact is making sure that we have stakeholder engagement. 
And at the very top level of that will be stakeholders who might be using or deploying the digital twins. And there might also be people who, are, who own the data that we're using to collect and to, to um, build and, and sort of home the digital twins. And underneath that iceberg, the great mass, are the people who will be affected by the digital twins themselves. Those people might be represented inside of the data sets. They might be not represented inside of the data sets. And making sure that we are continually engaging with, in health, you would call them patient and public involvement and engagement. In other areas, you might talk about citizen participation in the design of the work. And making sure that we have pathways for people to give us regular and critical feedback that we can action to deliver the positive societal impact um, rather than just a societal impact. And then finally, one of the things that we'll build are collaboration spaces. Those might be in person, uh, getting everyone into a room with a whole bunch of different post-it notes. It might be virtual, they might be hybrid. We'll probably look at running data study groups as part of our, the Turing Institute's uh, delivery of the skills team. And we'll also just make sure that we listen to the needs of everyone who's working inside of the trick to uh, respond to what they, what they require to work really collaboratively together. I think that's the end of the section on the trick. Would you like to introduce Tim and yes, Richard? I yeah. Will. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all co-directors. They made my job easy. Um, so we're just about hitting the half mark. OK, so now the slide is up. My next speakers are here. So yeah, the next session is on Project Bluebird. And we have Tim Dodwell and uh, Richard Cannon. Thank you. Okay, um, really great chance to tell you about a really exciting program. Uh, this is an EPSRC funded program, a prosperity partnership between NATS, uh, the Alan Turing Institute and Exeter University. Uh, it's a really exciting program where we're putting digital twins into action. And even last week, some of the results we're going to show to you are new. So this is, you know, frontline stuff, um, opportunity to share, opportunity to connect afterwards. Um, I'm Tim Dodwell, Turing AI Fellow. I'm an academic lead on this program. And I'm going to pass you over to Rich to tell you a bit about airspace. And if I do this... No? There we go. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Richard Cannon. I'm the, uh, the industry PI for Project Bluebird. And just, uh, just to say thanks to AI UK and the Turing Institute for extending that invite today and letting us talk about this uh, exciting research. Um, I'll let Tim talk about objectives and vision and ambition for the program. Um, but really what we want to do is we want to be the spearhead of research in ATC. We want to be making a difference and we want to be uh, to lead in the industry, especially in, uh, regarding data science and AI. Um, probably prudent then to talk a little bit about what, what is air traffic control because it is very much an invisible infrastructure in the sky. Um, Above our heads, there's about a million square kilometers of airspace above Britain. There's another two million out over the ocean. The, the National Air Traffic Service is not so responsible for the safe separation of aircraft. Um, when we uh, commercial pilots transition these uh, volumes in the sky, these volumes of sky, uh, they pass through these sectors and with, where there's human teams making decisions. Not systems, but human teams making decisions every day to safely separate aircraft. They do that by asking the aircraft to climb and descend, to go faster and slower, to change its speed, and to, uh, to turn left and right. And it really is as human-centric as that. 1,700 air traffic controllers moving aircraft through the sky every day, 8,500 flights on this day back in, back in July, a little bit busier than what it is today, um, issuing up to more than 100,000 safety-critical instructions per day. So very much a human-centered system and we'll see more of this animation later on in the presentation. So let's talk about Project Blue. I saw that animation about two years ago when I was working, started working with Nats, and I was hooked. I mean, I thought, this is, a, this is amazing. And I sat and watched it about five times, showed it to my kids. They were hooked. They said, what on earth is that? And then we kind of said, well, very human-centric, very safety-critical, but what are the opportunities in AI uh, and data science? And so we set out this program. It has three major parts. Component part, which is relevant today, is about 
a digital twin, 20 million flight records we have of UK data. Uh, how do we use it to make better predictions, understand how planes move around? Can we forecast better? Can we understand airspace design better? Machine learning control, can we build agents that, you know, can we test agents and algorithms that could maybe have a go at doing that kind of job? What do they look like? Um, can you make them, you know, safe? Uh, can you uh, do different ways of controlling airspace, which maybe is different to how an ATCO would have done them? But the really important thing that we really want to focus on is ultimately it's safety critical, right? So how are we going to build a system where an ATCO can trust or work with um, AI? And that doesn't mean full automation. That means augmentation. That means helping in training. Uh, it means lots of levels. But there's a huge piece here that the real difficulty is about stepping towards that trust piece. What will it require? What you'll notice is not only is this data scientist machine learners like myself, but it's also working with industry, it's working with regulators, it's working with diverse academics. And really essential, this is how we bring that community together. Uh, okay, so what's a digital twin? Like, so actually, when you look at this system, I sat down and looked at it, and think, oh, there's so many component parts to this. You could do airports, you could do uh, met data. We made a choice to focus through the human the ATCO, to build a digital twin that sees uh, airspace through the lens of an ATCO and really focus on that decision-making piece. So um, our digital twin, we call it a probabilistic digital twin because we really care about uncertainty and quantifying risk, but we're going to focus through that. And we've created an infrastructure called ARC, which provides data and com compute for a community to start exploring what these ideas might look like. So um, just last week, we've been running this program now for 18 months. We, that's built on a pilot uh, project uh, with Turing uh, over the previous two years. So what we decided to do is take a snapshot of where the, what, what does the research look like right now. So this is a snapshot from last week, what have our teams working on um, right now in preparation for a, a rather large activity coming up in May. So we have a data and community. It's the seat of everything. It's where we, we, uh, we work together, where we code together, and we, we share the debugging pain of all the software in here. Uh, and it's also where we put our data. So lots of flight records, very sensitive data. There's military flights and so on and so forth in there. So we have to be very careful. Architecture and configuration, really important that we lower the barriers for machine learners, for data scientists. We don't want to have to train you too much in air traffic control in order for you to make a contribution to this program. So really important to get the architecture right. Really important that you can make a contribution quickly. Uh, we have a core team of air traffic controllers. Those people, one of those, some of those 1,700 people that are moving aircraft every single day, um, we have them as part of the core team. They help us design the tools. They design the trust and the transparency piece and help us in that regard. We have access to the, to the, the air traffic control college. Air traffic controllers have to go to college and pass their exams just like everyone else. Um, and, and in there, we have access to the curriculum, curriculum-based learning, which is useful for um, uh, behavioral cloning and, and, and reverse reinforcement learning. That's really important for us. Uh, we have access to the training infrastructure. Uh, and of course, we have access to the data. So we can use the data to complement our findings with uh, what is the strategy for the airspace? How do we actually do tactical air traffic control? Uh, Tim will talk about path prediction, which is, is uh, we've got some publications in that space. Oh, it's worth mentioning just one more bubble, which is the scenario generation. Um, we, we do go to a lot of effort to ensure that we are not just building systems that are very, very good at working in nominal conditions. We are always looking, and we're, we've got weak signal analysis, and we're always looking for the precursors for when things are really complicated, and that's when air traffic controllers really step up and, and they provide that service then. We have to make sure that our agents are trained in the same circumstances. So we do a lot of analytical research to understand what makes air traffic control complicated? And sometimes, there's a group of researchers just now looking at Storm Eunice, which is, if you remember, it was a storm this time last year, which, which uh, uh, did, uh, did uh, modify, shall we say, the air traffic control system over London for a while. Um, but it's, it's more than that. There's uh, the very subtle things can make really uh, quite large challenges for the air traffic control team. So we have these generative models that create these scenarios to make sure the agents are trained. Thanks, Tim. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna fly through this bit because I want to get onto the control bit, the flashy bit at the end, right? But one key thing um, in statistical modeling is around path prediction. So in the top left, you see uh, uncertainty quantification about an envelope of possible climbs of a of a, of a plane uh, climbing out of an airport. It's a really important question when you're doing control. You want to understand the safe envelope in which you can protect airspace. So new probabilistic methods uh, can learn from data appropriate uh, bounds on, on containing those flights under predictions. So it's not about just making predictions, having better understanding of where things are going to be in the next five minutes. When you build agents, you need to generate realistic scenarios from your data. So a really key thing, what you're seeing down in the bottom is an ens deep ensemble model, which is basing, generating possibly true realistic scenarios to put in front of the agent along paths which have been observed from the data. Really exciting area. Lots of math in here, but also very applied. So, you know, perfect for an academic. Okay, so uh, a really important part of the, the air traffic control network is, of course, our airports. Um, when you're sitting at the gate waiting for your aircraft to depart, air traffic control feels the pain. Um, this is where most of our uncertainty is in the system. Um, so, and, and you're part of that, and you have to experience that with us. Um, so it's really important that we model that uncertainty. Um, so what we have here is a, a model of Stansted Airport, which is our, uh, our third busiest airport, actually, in the UK, over 14, um, on, passing, on um, aircraft movements. And, and I'm showing this for a reason, and that it's really important that we model this aspect within our digital twin. But I think more than that, it's a, it's a testimony to the community and the architecture that we mentioned before. Um, it's been, it takes a long time to get these models up and get them running and to look at and ask some research questions, which in this case, we're looking at the use of speed optimization to uh, reduce taxi times and fuel burn at, the, uh, at Stansted itself. Uh, and you can see the fuel burn calculation running along the bottom. On the left-hand side, we've got the 7th of, uh, the 12th of July, I beg your pardon, 2021. Uh, this is the human uh, sitting in the tower, moving the aircraft around. And on the right-hand side, we have an agent doing the, the same job. So we're, in this case, we're just using a common task framework, and we're looking at the, the comparisons between, between the two. The great boost that we've got here is this comes from a different EPSRC grant. This comes from a, some excellent work being done at uh, Queen Mary University in London. Um, and as I say, it, take, it usually takes quite a long time to get these models up and running. Once we had the ARC and the data in the community ready and the ACC was on, by, uh, on standby, uh, it just took eight weeks to get this model ready. So we, we're using the benefits of, of that, that Bluebird ecosystem. And now we have this really essential component within our air traffic control model ready to go. Um, and the, the work itself has shown some great benefits already. And we're looking to, uh, to, to further validate that. So what we're looking at here is some really recent research. So our first agents controlling UK airspace. And actually what you're looking at is the same scenario you saw at the beginning. Uh, we're, we're controlling something called LMS. So on the left-hand side, it's what ATCOS did uh, in the real world, 1st of July um, in 2019. On the right-hand side, it's a dynamic optimization agent built by, um, some, well, built by the team, but led by some researchers at Exeter. Uh, particularly George Darth, and, it, and it's, it's amazing to see it come together because there's a lot of infrastructure around this, like the software that has to be added. This is on real-world data. Every part has to come together. Then finally, you can start solving some real-world problems. What you see is when it goes dark green, essentially the agent's taking control, and then when it goes sort of a hollow, um, hollow green color, it's basically passed it on to the next sector. I may, like Brilliantly, this, this has been provably safe by, you know, ATCOs accepted this as a safe solution to doing ATC. And if you ever spoken to an ATCO, they, you know, they're hard to impress. So it was a real milestone for our project 18 months in. I think what it does is it's going to lead us into the next stage of our program, which is where it gets even more exciting. So the where should we go next? So we've been on this for 18 months now, and there's quite a large team. We've got some siloed excellence here. We've got community excellence also. So why not bring it all together? Um, let's bring the team of 30 plus people together to build, put a digital twin in front of um, air traffic controllers and to test a human machine collaboration experiment. So let's just do that. Let's just bring all the software that we've created, all the tools and practices and the methodology and put that around the validation framework. So between May and July this year, 
Uh, we are running this, this experiment at Swanwick Area Control Centre uh, down in Southampton. And we're using these sectors that, that Tim's just mentioned, this LUS and the LMS. And what we've decided to do in service of the validation objectives is actually just to give an entire sector to an agent to let it run air traffic control. We've held back some historical data, of course, so the, 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 the ACO shouldn't recognize the data because it's from a few years ago. Um, and we were holding, holding that back from the agent. So we've got a dozen or two dozen days of real data and we're going to put the human on one sector say it's just on the left-hand side, and we'll put the agent on the other. So we're looking at those objectives of um, uh, working in proximity with a machine, um, does it disrupt the human workflow, does it impact the problem solvability, all those wonderful things. But it's more than that. It's about bringing the community together on Bluebird for one objective, to put it all together and to make it run, and this would then be a world's first. There's also a friendly competition with uh, one, a cash prize. Um, I won't tell you how much where we've got the, uh, the team working on optimizations, different techniques to, to design these agents and, and, and uh, run these agents. And we'll go through a, a competition phase and uh, hopefully one agent will make it. Not Tim's, it's not very good. Um, George's agent will probably make it through and then we'll put that in front of the air traffic controller. So this is a great opportunity to build hundreds of hours worth of validation data with human and machine in the loop on what is a safety critical application. Um, it's also the time in the program where we can say, hey, we've, we've just activated theme one, theme two, and theme three. So we, we see the ecosystem on Bluebird really working. Um, and we think we've lowered the barriers for, for entry from lots of different disciplines within AI and data science. So with respect to that, and with only a few seconds to go, if you're interested in Bluebird, please do reach out to myself and Tim. Uh, there's lots of opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really great. So, um, yeah, just shout out if you want to see them at the end, find them. And our final speaker before the Q&A, I will just like to welcome um, Sarah Hayes. Thank you. Hello. I'm Sarah Hayes. I'm the engagement lead for Credo, the Climate Resilience Demonstrator Project working with Connected Places Catapult. And I want to talk to you today about the journey towards connected digital twins and how I see the Turing Institute at the center of that journey. So for me, the journey towards connected digital twins started back in 2017 when I was working at the National Infrastructure Commission. And I was working on a report data for the public good. And when we were carrying out this research, we issued two calls for evidence. And the Turing Institute responded to both those calls for evidence. And the responses from the Turing Institute were instrumental in informing our recommendations and helping us develop those recommendations. So the report, data for the public good, set out the vision for a national digital twin as an ecosystem of connected digital twins. And it recommended that we need a framework for sharing data across infrastructure sectors. And it also recommended that we need a pilot project or a demonstrator project to show the art of the possible, to show that we can share data across sectors and that there's benefit from doing so. And after the report was published, I had a number of conversations with Alan Wilson, then CEO of the Turing Institute. And Alan was very supportive, extremely supportive, about the idea of a pilot project. And he was very keen that we take this forward. And so under the Centre for Digital Built Britain and the Digital Twil Twin Hub, that project later became Credo, the Climate Resilience Demonstrator Project, which was launched in March 2021. And when we were originally putting together the ideas for this demonstrator project, James Hetherington, a Turing Fellow, was very much involved in setting out the proposal and helping us get the funding to take Credo forward. And now Credo has been taken forward into what we call the second phase, led by Connected Places Catapult. And we hope that Credo will be taken forward into the future through further collaborative research and development and innovation funding. 
So we're talking about digital twins this afternoon, and uh, of course, we always have to talk about what a what, a, what is a digital twin? And I find it helpful to describe what a digital twin is rather than to be too definitive. And I also want to draw upon the distinction between singular di digital twins and also connected digital twins. So I would say that a digital twin is a digital representation of something physical. And that something physical could be in the past, the present, or the future. But there's some kind of data relationship between the physical and the digital. And we can use data in the digital world to help us make a decision that then impacts on the digital world. And when we're developing our digital twins, it's really important to think about the purpose. What's it for? What's the use case? What problem are we solving? And with Credo, we're looking at climate resilience. So we're looking at the impact of extreme weather events in the future across the infrastructure system. And we also want to think about the stakeholders. So who's using the, the digital twin to make the decision? And in the case of Credo, this is the asset owners. And then who will be impacted by that decision? And that's people in Credo, it's people like you and me, people who live in areas that will be impacted by climate change in the future. And as I mentioned, you don't want to just think about your own digital twin in isolation to other digital twins. You don't necessarily want to think about your own water net network digital twin or an energy network digital twin. You want to think about how your digital twin can connect up with other digital twins so that you can share data across organizations and across sectors as part of an ecosystem of connected digital twins. So Credo is a climate change adaptation digital twin. It brings together data across energy, water, and telecoms networks. We work with Anglian Water, with BT and OpenReach, and with UK Power Networks, who bring their people and their data to this project. So you can see when you bring the data about assets together, you can see the connections between the networks, and you can see the interdependencies across the infrastructure system. And in Credo, we're looking at the impact of extreme weather events in the future. So extreme storms and the impacts of flooding across the infrastructure system. So we have flood data in the digital twin, which shows us what future flood scenarios might look like. And the Credo digital twin looks at the probabilities of assets failing when they're wet. And then it, it takes those wet failed assets and it propagates the failure of those wet failed assets across the whole system. So you can see, as a result of the original storm, the number of assets that will be out of service, the, the assets with red rings around them. And you'll see that there'll be assets that are in dry areas that are out of service because they are dependent on wet failed assets. So a tool like this helps us to see the cascade of failure across the whole system. So it's helping us to think about these big questions about what can we do to prepare for climate change and how can we, how can we adapt? So how can we protect cities in advance of these kind of weather events happening? And if we had a live data connection, how could we respond in an emergency situation? So it really is helping us think about these big questions about system resilience and adaptation. So the vision for Credo is that Asset owners would be using a tool like Credo, and it would look something like this, a dashboard like this, where they'd be able to assess the impact of different interventions. So, for example, perhaps they would think about relocating a power substation outside of the flood zone, or installing backup generators, or increasing the flood protection around certain sites. But what they would want to be able to do is to assess the impact of those different interventions and understand the level of cost, the, uh, the carbon impact and the level of resilience that would be offered by these different interventions. And the idea here is that the asset owners can come together and look at which intervention will deliver the most uh, resilience across the whole system, rather than just thinking about individual network resilience. So in the course of developing Credo, we found visualizations really helpful and synthetic data 
very helpful. So we've been working with confidential asset data. Um, so we have to use synthetic data to help us tell the story in public of what we're doing in Credo. And we have this visualization, which is published on the Digital Twin Hub. And you can go on the, the site and you can have a look. You can have a play around with the, the assets, see the connections, see at what point they get wet and, and when they fail. So this gives you an idea of the kind of dashboard that an asset owner would be using in the future. And uh, what, what's happening now is that the, there's a collaboration between the Turing Institute and Newcastle University and they are developing a new set of synthetic data for us for a future phase of Credo. And we are finding it, it really helpful to be able to work with synthetic data in the course of this project. And we've had input from Turing Fellows throughout. So I mentioned James Hetherington. We've had Gav Gavin Shaddock involved. We've had input from the Joint Centre for Excellence in Environmental Intelligence. And we've also had Chris and Jim working with us throughout Credo. So Chris has been working on uh, the decision support side and Jim is uh, looking at the asset failure models. So it's been really important for us to have that expertise. And I'm really hopeful that in the future that we will have further input from Turing in future phases of uh, Credo. So I want to say a few words about data sharing architectures and to share with you some of the lessons that we've learned over the last two years. So in the first phase of Credo, we were under a lot of time pressure. So what we did was we put all the confidential asset data into one central database. We used a centralized data sharing architecture. And uh, by doing that, we were able to protect the data, keep it confidential, and adhere to the terms of the, the data license. But there were two problems that we found with this particular approach. We found that uh, because of the, the security we had around the, the, the data, in the, the time scale that we had for the first phase, we didn't have the time to develop the security, the authentication processes that we needed to share the, the insights from Credo back with the asset owners. And of course, that's the point of Credo. So we needed to address that in the second phase. And then the, the second problem that we encountered is scalability. So with a, a centralized data sharing architecture, the problem is, <coughs> that there will be limits to scalability. So it worked for the purposes of the first phase, being able to protect the data. But if we wanted to add uh, further asset owners, further regions, other types of data in the future, then we're going lim you know, to hit limits here. There's going to be problems with using a central database. And of course, if we think about a national digital twin, that's not one great big database of everything. It's, it, the idea is it's an ecosystem of connected digital twins. So in the second phase, we have been exploring a distributed data sharing architecture. It should be, it says centralized in the corner, sorry, it should be distributed. And the idea here is that the asset owners are able to retain control over their own data. So we're not producing lots of copies of the data. We are, we are using a distributed architecture. So what we're doing in Credo is we are able to take the data from the asset owners in its native form and we use a common data structure to, to create interoperability across those data sets so that we can pull it together, put it in through a central node, run it through our models and get the insights that we need because of course we need to, we're pulling data together from different sources so we need to create that interoperability. And what we found has been really important for us to think about in this second phase of uh, Credo is these padlocks. So these access security and quality protocols. So how are we sharing data across these different organizations? And we've had to think about, have we got the right agreement in place? And, and we've also had to focus on developing the right multi-factor authentication processes so that we can share those insights back with the asset owners, obviously the point of what we're trying to do in Credo. So what we're able to do with this distributed architecture is to get the data from the asset owners, be able to run it through our models and share the insights back with the asset owners. And crucially, with a distributed architecture, we're able to open Credo up in the future with the right padlocks, the right controls in place, 
so that we, uh, we can have other users of Credo being able to access the data if they've got the right agreement in place and being able to bring in other asset owners across other sectors, transport, um, gas, and, uh, and other regions of the UK. So we have an ambition to be able to expand Credo to, to other sectors and other regions. But what's really important for us is to think about these access security and quality protocols. So this is all part of our journey towards connected digital twins. And I, and I talk about these padlocks, these access security quality protocols, and I think when we're all talking about our different digital twin projects, we need to be talking about what do we mean by those padlocks? What do we have in place as our answer for the data sharing agreement, for the quality protocols, for the access protocols? What is it that we've developed that's bespoke for our own projects that we can start to share and, and develop in common? So how can we all here start to develop what could be best practice uh, access, security, and quality protocols. So best practice padlocks is, is what I'm looking for. And I think we, all, we should all be on that journey together in sharing what we're doing and aiming to develop those padlocks together. And I think we also need to be thinking about an ecosystem distributed architecture. So not the Credo distributed architecture, but a bigger, wider a ecosystem distributed architecture where we're able to share data across organizations and across sectors as part of an ecosystem of connected digital twins, but sharing data in a safe and secure way. So in Credo, we've been working with a, a number of partners. I've, I've mentioned the Joint Center of Excellence uh, in Environmental Intelligence and a, a number of partners in phase one and phase two. But it, for us, it really is a collaboration across industry academia and, and government and I think that's really important in a digital twin project like this. If you're keen to get involved in uh, Credo in a future phase then please head to the digital twin hub if you're an asset owner uh, or a regulatory uh, a regulator or policy maker keen to talk to you about system resilience cross-sector um, innovation funding and also that, that that funding question so also interested to talk to to funders about possible sources of future funding for projects like Credo. So please head to the Digital Twin Hub or come and talk to me in person. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's the last of our talks. But Sarah is not going to leave the stage. She's going to be the chair of the Q&A that we're going to have now. So I would like to invite um, all of the co-directors and Kirsty to join us on stage. You're, uh, yeah, yeah, just come, come on in, <laughs> whoever is on the panel. And there's a bunch of uh, questions already on Slido which is exciting. Uh, I also want to mention that um, Ruchi was supposed to join us, but unfortunately they cannot make it. But, you know, so um, listen, um, just a mention for that. Is there? I think it needs to, oh, there we go, reconnect. Yeah. So I, have, I'm gonna I have it on my phone, so maybe I'll start Great. with, I've, I, I've seen some questions on my phone, which I think are really good to kick us off, I'm so. I'm just gonna, because do you all have, Mics, I yeah. So, yeah. I think we do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Cool. So, do you did it did it open up here? It hasn't, but I I've got some on my phone. So. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. I'm gonna leave you to it. Okay. So, any questions you have, Someone just remember go to Slido. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Oh, and there's there. Yeah, there. Great. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. So yes. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to start with the most popular questions. There's a couple there, then I'm going to move to a couple of other questions that I've got up my sleeve here. Um, but let's start with that. The, the, the question that comes up, I think, in every uh, uh, digital twin discussion, uh, the, the definition question, but let's start with that. How is a digital twin different from a computer model? So who would like to start with that? Uh, John, go on then. Yeah, well, I think we're probably all going to have slightly different definitions of what a digital twin is. And uh, the thing I personally quite like to do is to get away from worrying too much about definitions. And I think someone said it in one of their talks. The important thing about the distinction between, between digital twins and models for me is that it is that interaction between the user and the use case and the data and how that data interacts with the, the, um, the digital elements to create some useful information. And I thought Keith, your talk gave some really interesting components of digital twin. So for me, a model is a component of a digital twin. It's a really important component, but it may not be the thing that uh, ultimately decides whether or not a digital twin is useful. 
Uh, it's, the, it's about bringing together everything that is interoperability, it's about the, the, the semantics, it's about the, the models and the decision tool at the end of it. And then just, yeah, just maybe to add to this specific question here, which is, which is, um, is picking up on you know, what's the difference between a complex computing model. I mean, the digital twin has to operate over a platform through a network. It needs hardware. Okay, so your complex computer model might be very sophisticated, but we don't normally try and deploy it in real time or a continuous kind of operational time over a network where you're reading in sensor data and so on. So that's one of the key differences. Okay, we've built models for a long time, very sophisticated models, and they'll obviously be integrated as a key part of a digital twin. They're a tool to use with inside a digital twin, but a model on its own in the, in the way that we tend to talk about it isn't in that, you know, used in that context. Um, I completely agree. I think the only thing I would add is that in its simplest form, I think of a digital twin as a decision support tool. And to be a really good decision support tool, then you need a model and you need, you need live data and you need an interface that you can interrogate the model with the, with the live dynamic data set that's updated. So whenever I get asked what's a digital twin, it's really just a decision support tool. Thanks, Kirsten. Any other perspectives? Should we, should we move on? Okay. Uh, so, what approach will be used to ensure that all the digital twins developed are interoperable and open rather than siloed and proprietary? David. Uh, I mean, yeah, this, so the question is pointing us towards, you know, the, the kind of open source rather, rather than closed source kind of development. I mean, I think if, if you look at as I, under, I uh, as I sort of interpret it, if you, if you, if you put digital tw twin into Google, you get a lot of sponsored links coming up at the top, right? And these are, tend to be through proprietary software vendors who are promoting products, which is, which is you know, fine. Um, that's, that community have, have been ahead of the game in kind of, you know, developing products for the uh, software products, particularly for, for digital twins. I think the open source community is lagged behind that, and I think there are some efforts to try and... Um, build an open source uh, community. In fact, as you've heard today, part of the remit of the trick is to democratize digital twin, you know, give access to digital twins, and that includes open source um, uh, code and, uh, and data. So I think we might see, I who knows what the future will bring, right? But what we might see is that those open source e efforts will grow and that they'll become sort of serious contenders within, within a sort of, uh, you know, a software ecosystem. But that's, that's to be, there's a kind of, you know, in, in early stage technology, there's, there's always a bit of a sort of battle between different um, potential providers. And I think that's what we're seeing in, in digital twin, particularly software right now. Um, and so let's see how it plays out. Yeah, so, so if I could add, because uh, David, I think you largely talked there about architectural interoperability. Uh, uh, and so we did a bit of work through NERC and co-sponsored by the Met Office actually around how you build a framework, what we called the information management framework for, in our case, environmental digital twins. Uh, and the fundamental thing we, we, we felt that was important in this context was thinking about trying to change every single person's activity in all the different thematics that might want to be interoperable is just completely implausible. So you, you don't try and create standards or frameworks which are delving deep into the sort of the individual pieces of work that people are doing, but you create frameworks that allow you to cross over. So having sort of semantic standards that are uh, create bridging ontologies, for example, that allow you to speak from one community to another is really fundamental to that. Setting standards that are quite simple at the interfaces so that you don't have to do a whole load of stuff to bridge those interfaces. I think uh, there's a lot of thinking that's gone into this. Um, it's not easy, but I think there's work we can do that will push that forwards in the trick. Kirsten? I'm just going to um, agree wholeheartedly it is so not easy. I think this is a really big question because... Um, when we say um, interoperable across the three themes, that's an enormous request. Um, we're not even interoperable within environment, or leave alone how environment fits with health or how health can fit with infrastructure. So this is one of the biggest challenges, actually, for, for the trick. Um, but it's something we, we've all spotted. It's prioritised, and it's one of the areas that we'll be working with the impact hub, so the central area of that Venn diagram that um, I think Kirsty presented. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key things that we're going to be looking at. How do we ensure that 
um, digital twins in the environment space are interoperable with one another and how can we federate with um, digital twins from other sectors as well. But massive challenge, really big question. Mm -hmm. And share the learning from all the different projects as, uh, as we go. Uh, I've, got, I've got a question here. So what's your key lesson learned so far when working with digital twins? Oh, can I, so, can I go on? Well, if I get in first, because you're going to have really good answers. If I get early, <laughs> then maybe I'll say something reasonably sensible. I think one of the biggest challenges, and I, I think John's definitely going to agree with this one, is to check that you're all speaking the same language so that we're using ontologies in the same way. Um, so, for example, we had a meeting of all the trip directors a couple of weeks ago, and um, we suddenly realised that we're not using uncertainty in the same way. Um, so when one of us is talking about it, it doesn't mean the same as it means to one of the others. So I think one of the big challenges to, is going to be to check that we are all talking about the same thing and that we're all facing the same direction and have a shared vision for this thing. Mm. Steve, what's your key lesson learned? So I, th I think as we've, we've had conversations between the different sectors and, and looking at the ways that different people are using digital twins in different applications, the, the scope of the challenge, I think, has really become clear and that the number of different domains and different areas that need to work together uh, to build a meaningful digital twin from an Internet of Things to a 5G to cloud computing to data management to modelling to AI to calibration, and the list goes on and on and then feeding all that back to informing information, and then having that information from the twin go back to the asset itself. And so looking at the scale of the problem, I think that it's, it's working out how to make this more accessible for, for many people, and how do we make kind of interoperative tools that reduce the barriers of entry to, to using digital twins in research and in applications. Okay. I think the main lesson I've learned is um, they should try as far as possible not to get drawn into a long discussion about what a digital twin is. <laughs> um, because if you ask two people what a digital twin is, you'll get three answers. Um, the main thing to do is to um, agree, potentially to disagree, but to allow that a digital twin um, will, will, will contain certain capabilities, will use certain technologies, will give certain benefits and then work within that um, broader framework to agree what you can do on a specific problem. I would completely agree with you. And I think I'm going to add my, my thoughts on that one. Um, and certainly in Credo, the lessons that we've learned um, really about communication. So we heard it earlier from Kirsty about um, the, the value of communication when working with digital twins. Um, and, and I think it's also quite important to make it as non-technical as possible when you're communicating about the digital twin, what, what is it for? And we found in the Credo project um, visuals, but also films. So it was great to see a film earlier on just explaining what Credo was about. We went, we went full, um, uh, we, we went very dramatic and fictional in our original Credo film. And that sort of helped set the vision for what we were trying to do. And I think it helped explain to a lot of you know, non-technical people what, what, what digital twins might be and, and how we can use them to help, help solve certain problems. So I think that's been my lesson learned is communication, but be as non-technical as, as possible. Could I come back on what Kirsten said earlier as well? I'm looking at a question down here that says, oh, it's just gone. Something about how uh, ERPs use, uh, using something like SAP uh, does something about APIs. And I read that and I thought, I have not a clue what any of those acronyms mean. <laughs> So there's a there's a there's a, uh, a real in practice uh, language barrier already mm -hmm. in this room that is is going to cause us not mm -hmm. not to speak to to each other very well. So it would have sounded much better if I'd actually had the letters in there, but it, it disappeared in front of my eyes just as I was saying it. Okay, another one. Um, what are the main blockers and enablers to achieving the digital twin vision we've been talking about today? So a blocker, an enabler. So I, I'd say one of, the, one of the challenges is going to be getting all of the different parts to work together. And that, as I said, there are so many different elements. And putting them together in a seamless way where all of the bits come together and work and uh, work in a way which is meaningful from an operational perspective. And so it's, it's all well and good. As, as you know, synthetic data is great. You can learn a lot from synthetic data. But certainly in healthcare, we're always surprised at how varied our patients can be. 
and that no matter how much synthetic data we have, there's always one patient or, or a couple who will always be outliers and we'd always like to make sure that all of the services we have work for all of the patients we have coming to the hospital. So, so for me, that, that is a, a challenge of getting all of the different components working together. I think one of the enablers is certainly the, the Turing itself uh, and that it does bring together a broad range of people. It has a lot of call services, which gives a sustained kind of group of expertise to enable bringing all of this technology together. And also through having multiple different sectors have multiple different groups who have shared learnings that they can kind of bring together on for each person's problem. I think I'll probably also add that one of the enablers here is we really, really want this to work. Um, and that goes right up to uh, the people setting um, the political framework for the UK. So I had a really long train trip yesterday. And it was so long, though, I actually managed to read the report that came out last week on the future of computing in the UK. Um, I also read the science and technology framework. It was a really, really long train <laughs> trip. And both of these reports highlight how important AI is going to be for the UK if we want to become a science superpower. And this is the moment for data science and AI. This is our moment in the sun. So everything is aligning now for us to really push forward and deliver something amazing through the trick and other AI initiatives. So um, if you're working in the field, well done, you have chosen well. Now is your moment. I would agree. I think it can be driven forward by will. It has to be. So you talked about blocks and challenges, and I think one of the blocks or challenges is, is uh, making sure we deliver something that uh, is tractable and uh, demonstrable in, in each of these spaces mm -hmm. so that we can demonstrate that we have made some, made some progress. Because there is a lot of hope that we can deliver something really good, um, but the, if we aim too high and don't, don't achieve anything tangible, we will we'll struggle to, to keep mm -hmm. the intention, I think, of the people. And, and on that subject, what's your biggest concern about using digital twins? Oh, God, everyone's looking at me. Um, I, I think, that, you know, as excited as I am about digital twins and how much hope I have for AI um, in terms of helping the UK become a science superpower, I think we need to be really careful to guard against um, overhyping this. Um, I think we need to, like John said, we need to deliver something. We've made some pretty big promises here. Um, we need to be able to show in a year's time, in three years' time, we need to show some of the impact of the things that have been invested in and to come good on some of the promises that are being made here. And it's not going to be easy. Things like the, the question we had on interoperability, that's a massive, massive question. And um, none of us have the answer yet. We will do eventually, but we don't yet have it. Um, so coming good on all of this, I think, is going to be really, really important. So, so I think one of the enablers is fairly straightforward. Given that digital twins are, are, are some sort of optimal fusion of the, the physical and data-based analysis, um, one of the biggest enablers is machine learning technology. And that's come forward in leaps and bounds over the last 20 years or more and put us in a position where we can do a lot of things that we couldn't conceive of before. And so that is an enabler, I think. Yeah, so, so I'm a ocean modeler by my background, and I, and I think this, this sense that we are much more, uh, we're at the sort of dawn of a place where people like do the traditional modeling like I do can actually embrace the idea of AI and ML being part of our ecosystem of tools, I think is a really, is really exciting thing for us, actually. And it will open up ways of transforming the way we do traditional forecasting uh, in a way that I think could be really exciting. It's sort of related a bit to a blocker as well, because um, one blocker being really parochial, um, w working in the field we work in, one blocker is that sometimes we really don't know the physics of certain processes or mechanisms very well. Um, and then your main means of making progress is to create some hybrid model incorporating data from the structure of the system of interest and any inarguable physics that you've got, and then you'll get something better. And you might get the predictive capability you're looking for from the hybrid. 
So let's take the, the top question here. So given a lack of sufficient data to train AI models in many relevant applications, for example, in healthcare, do you see digital twins as a means to provide such data, Steve? Yeah, so I, I, I see digital twins as a, as a number of implications for, for AI and, uh, model, training AI models. And so one is that I think digital twins provides a prior, as I mentioned, about encoding physics and encoding physiology. And that allows you to bring more information in to augment your standard uh, clinical data sets. I also see that it's an opportunity where digital twins provide an opportunity of doing extreme cases where there are some scenarios which you may never have data for or have very limited data for because they're really rare events, yet you would still like your AI network to correctly classify this. So I think of the uh, car simulators where they're trying to train self-driving cars and they want to train what happens when a horse walks in front of the car. Now, I've spent time in, uh, in, in around Stanford where the cars are. There aren't that many horses drive, walking around, but that's the kind of thing that you can simulate or other more edge cases which allow you to then train your algorithms for the cases you might not have rich data for. And I think that from a simulation perspective, if we can train uh, the AI networks or, or models on simulated data for edge cases for rare events, we can then make those much more resilient to those events or at least have a chance or be able to verify that they're able to detect those events correctly. So I think that those are the kind of different elements where they could be involved. Sorry. Yeah, no, I completely agree with what you just said. I, I just wanted to just urge a note of caution here. There's always the danger that people will try and think about digital assets as a, as a replacement for the underpinning data. And uh, I, I think digital twins will lower the barrier of access to lots of data and they really should and that's one of the benefits. But if people think about this as a replacement for the underlying data sets that we, we really do need to have, that's, that's a dangerous place to be. So we really need to think about digital twins as a way of maximising the, opti uh, the optimal use of our data, but also making the case for better resourcing where that we should uh, obtain the data from and making the case for where data is really important. So uh, there is an advocacy space here, I think, for digital twins to make sure we're getting the right data and we're making it clear what the data is used for and is useful for. I would agree with that. So should we tackle this, um, uh, another question here? Um, oh, it's moved up in the, they've all moved up in the list. There was one here, how can we make assurances that a digital twin gives reliable results? Can we trust them? Well, I, I mean, I, I could start off, maybe others will have um, things to add as well. I mean, I think trust in, in, in predictions or trust in outputs of digital twins is a, is a crucial kind of um, uh, performance metric of a digital twin. I think the, the way that, that I've been thinking about it and with, in discussions with Keith and others, you know, is un underlying uncertainty modeling is really uh, a key part of the digital twin, it needs to be built in throughout all of the components. So if we're thinking about a digital twin as having some components, I like to think about it as a, as a recipe with ingredients, like a sort of cooking thing, right? So then we can all do, cook our digital twins, and, you, and you're cooking something slightly different from me, but we've got recipe which is sort of broadly the same and with some ingredients. So the uncertainty, quantification and propagation really needs to be an integral part of that, so that we can try and follow and, 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 and aggregate and augment all of these things together to get some sense of what we trust of what's coming out. But I don't know whether you want to yeah. No, on I, that. I, I agree with David. Uh, but I think one of the ways that, well, that component in the, the big diagram that said model validation and verification is, is absolutely crucial. And as David says, it should be probabilistic so that we um, encode any uncertainty in the thing but we can also sometimes we can we can um, shape the way we judge the model so that it'll appear more reliable in, in some respects so if, if, forgive me for just going on a minute um, we, we built a structural health monitoring system mm -hmm. based on a structure and we, we judged it by how well it was able to classify the different states of health of the structure. And when we looked at it in that light, it wasn't brilliant. It was 65% correct. Now, if we took, if instead we judged it on whether it made the correct decision on the basis of the diagnosis, 
the decision accuracy went up to 95%. Because it didn't really occur where it was damaged. Mm -hmm. It just said, okay, this needs an inspection now, which was one of the decisions. So you could, you could choose the way you frame the decision support there to make it more reliable. Yeah, I think that's an inter very interesting point, and one of the ways I've heard digital twins described is, is to be able to minimise our likelihood of making mistakes, just using them to make less mistakes everywhere. John. So, so there's a long history of um, uncertainty analysis in the weather forecasting and climate forecasting uh, communities where they have ensembles of either perturbed solutions of the same models or ensembles of different models, and that creates a really interesting and very well established science behind how you do uncertainty in, 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 a, in a very concrete context. Where I think digital twins really challenge us is you have compound uncertainties coming in where you aggregate data from different places. And I think this idea of how you um, bring together uncertainties from different spheres and then the science around that is a, is a challenge we should really be focusing on as a community. Okay. I think I was, uh I completely agree, John. And um, the other thing I, I was going to mention, which I think is related, is that um, one of the way to one of the ways to judge the quality of a digital twin is through the user's perspective. So, for example, through the uh, demonstrator that you're developing at NOC for marine protected a um, areas, I know that you're working very closely with DEFRA on how exactly do they want to be able to use the digital twin and what policies they want to um, influence and shape as a result of that. So I don't We've got a number of interesting questions here. I'm going to skip to the, the latest question. Do we need a regulatory function to certify certain <laughs> digital twins are fit for purpose in critical applications? For example, medical, similar to drug regulation, Steve? Yeah, so I, th I think that that's a great question, and it's something which uh, it will be very interesting to see how uh, the UK's new independence in the regulatory space uh, uh, affects that. Uh, so certainly working with the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration from, from America, they are really investing in how you can use simulations and digital twins to inform regulatory processes, particularly for medical devices. They've already started a program uh, working for uh, drug risk evaluation. So I think that there is a, a kind of acceptance within some of these uh, regulatory bodies on the processes for uh, verification and validation, how to establish model credibility, how to establish twin credibility based on an individual, how to establish credibility for cohorts uh, of twins, and how that will then fit into the regulatory space. And I, I'd be very intrigued to see how the developments from uh, the In Silico UK, which is kind of an advocacy uh, group for this type of uh, work, uh, feed into the MHRA and then lead to possibly the, the greater adoption of this uh, in the UK. So I could, I could just add, um, it depends what you mean by standards precisely, but the, just in the, on the manufacturing side, I know that the uh, high value manufacturing catapult um, and others who work within the catapult centres um, and Sarah, you're from CPC, right? So CPC have been involved as well. There's already some, an early stage ISO standard, like a sort of industrial standard for digital twins related to manufacturing processes. So I think, I think it's, it will evolve um, in all these different sectors. I mean, Steve, you just mentioned about health, right? But I think in all, in all industrial sectors, eventually as new technologies start to become more mature, People ask these questions like, "What you know? We need a standard to work to, and, it, and it's and it's a kind of natural evolution then, for you know regulatory bodies to put in place the standards that, that are appropriate at that time. So I think it will evolve essentially, and it's already those early early stage signs that it, it's starting to anyway. And certainly, we would see regulators across all sectors being able to use digital twins in the future more and more, being able to have more information at their fingertips to make the decisions that they need to make. Um, okay, uh, the one about, uh, so what, what does democratizing digital twin tech look like in practice? Can digital twins be used as a tool for public or stakeholder participation? Can I advertise a piece of work we're doing? So yes, I think it's the answer and it should be and uh, that's one of the ambitions uh, and I'd like to advertise some work done by, uh, in collaboration between ourselves in the British Ge Geological Survey and there's a Centre for Ecology and Hydrology where we're creating an asset register of components of a digital twin that we're building. We mentioned the marine protected area digital twin. The assets that we build, that will be standards, that will be uh, 
the, the, the architectural designs, it will be the, the, the actual pointers to the, de the data sets we're using, they are all going to be made public and, and that's something we want to expand on in the trick. So absolutely 100%. Brilliant. Um, so uh, can we get a quick answer to the question, uh, do digital twins necessarily involve AI? No. There we go. Well, I hope that answers it. Oh, no, no, yeah, David's not too entirely any, any convinced. I, yeah, I mean, they, perhaps they don't necessarily involve AI, but I think that all the ones that I've seen that would involve AI, some type of AI um, makes it, makes it um, you know, it gives it more functionality, I guess. I think we need a distinction between AI and machine learning because I would say they all necessarily involve some form of learning from data, but that won't necessarily involve um, a decision capa uh, making capability in the in the software. And it depends whether you treat uh, traditional what we would call data assimilation as AI. Yeah. Okay, so I've got one last question for you, and I, I want to hear from all members of the panel. Um, where do you think we'll be on our digital twin journey in five years' time? Maybe I can, I'm going to start with Kirsten. Come, th come this way. Oh, gosh, in five years' time. In five years' time, I really hope we've got some exciting demonstrators and that we have not only some demonstrators which get people fired up and they think, oh, my God, that's possible. I could do that in my area. Um, but we also have tools and guides that help people create tools, uh, sorry, digital twins in their own areas. So I'm hoping for a tool set and I'm hoping for some good demonstrators in five years. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay. Um, in five years, um, I think we'll be a bit further along <laughs> with... <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> with, with the theory, um, the underpinning technology for digital twins. Um, I think that's going to be potentially a long haul. Um, I, I agree with Kirstine. Um, we should have some fairly compelling demonstrators within five years, I think, if not because of the trick, but because the, the energy is there to do that now. David? Yeah, so um, we talked, to, there was a question earlier about software and uh, closed and open source. So I think in five years would be a good measure of, of how the perhaps the open source um, offerings are, are, are going to um, shape up by then. That would be another interesting thing to watch. Yeah, I, I think in five years' time we'll probably be talking less about digital twins and more about how we use our digital tools in a way that is useful. Um, and, and I suspect there'll be, there's, there's such a diversity of what digital twins are, I think it, it will become more about which bits of it we really need to improve tomorrow. Uh, so I suspect we're talking about digital twins less, but using them more, is my hope. Hopefully. Steve? And I, I think I would, I would like to see that we had a better framework for linking digital twins together and creating interoperability, interoperability, interoperability between the digital twins and health and environment and infrastructure and, and bringing those together into kind of having a multi-sector uh, digital twin system. I like that. Interoperability and uh, excellent use cases. Good examples of using digital twins. Okay, I think that's all that we've got time for today on the panel. Yes, it is. I'm here. Uh, I was here making like eye contact with them to be quick, uh, and it worked. But thank you. I want to hear a big round of applause to all of our speakers today. <laughs>